Okay, in this uh, video, we're going to be looking at the minor parties or emerging parties in the UK. Um, so these are the smaller parties other than the big three. Um, so uh, what we need to know for the exam basically is a little bit about each of some, well, we need to know a little bit about some of them, what some of their main ideas are, but crucially, what influence do they have? Are they a big influence or not? So the first part we're going to have a look at, when we look at, through, look at the Scottish National Party, the Green Party and UKIP's Joe Brexit Party. Again, though, feel free to look at any other parties. The DUP, for example, from Northern Ireland uh, was quite influential under Theresa May. So again, do feel free to do a similar job at what I've done here on the DUP. Anyway, the Scottish National Party. There are three reasons why the Scottish National Party might be considered major, might be considered to be influential in British politics, and they are here. They're the third largest party in the UK in terms of membership size. They've got 114,000 members, which is more than the Liberal Democrats have, and I don't think it's that far behind what the Conservative Party have either in terms of membership. So they're quite a big party in terms of members, They've got the third largest number of MPs in the House of Commons, which again might make it be seen as being a major party, an influential party. So in 2015 they had 55 MPs, they went down to 35 in 2017. I confess I can't remember how many they got in 2019. I know they did gain a few, for example they gained the Joe Swinson seat, didn't they, for the Lib Dems, for example. So they are up a few more from 35. And they've also been in government in Scotland since 2007, so for 13 years they've been running the government in Scotland, which again must make them an, make them an influential political party. Okay, a very brief history of the party, just so you know roughly where they've come from. They were formed in 1934 and their aim has always been that they want independence for Scotland. They've always had at least one MP in the House of Commons since 1967. And they did have some influence in the 1970s. Uh, Labour lost its majority in the House of Commons. They relied upon some small parties like the Scottish Nationalists to help them along. Um, 1979, though, the Scottish National Party fell out with Labour and that partly led to the collapse of the Labour government um, of that year. They really made a comeback, though, under the leadership of this character, a man called Alex Salmond. Quite a charismatic kind of character, quite um, an influential kind of character, very good with the media. Um, he was leader for 10 years up until year 2000. He then, the party then didn't do so well when he left, uh, but then he became leader again in 2004 and the party's fortunes really kind of grew. And they exploited the new Scottish Parliament, which Labour created in 1999. And as we said before, they actually formed a minority government in 2007, and then they won a landslide election in Scotland in 2011. So, um, again, you can see the influence of this one individual. The party did OK till 2000, it then did really badly for four years, then when he came back it really kind of grew uh, and became a very successful party. It does an issue sometimes with small parties that leadership is really important uh, from them by certain characters. Now, in 2014, uh, you could argue they had quite a lot of influence on the whole British politics when they had this referendum in Scotland. David Cameron didn't really need to, you know, he had that coalition government with the Liberal Democrats, but there's this real recognition that the Scottish National Party ran the Scottish government, they seem to be growing in power, they seem to be, you know, saying, you know, a lot of their influence, some thought, came from this idea that the horrible English were preventing them from having a referendum on independence. So for whatever reason, David Cameron thought, well, we'll have the referendum, and if it's a big no vote, that kind of kills off the Scottish Nationalists, I suppose. It didn't quite work out that way, because the country did vote no, but not by a massive amount. Um, and what you then saw was a real big growth of membership of the Scottish National Party. Because a lot of those people who, before the referendum, may have, you know, wanted independence but didn't feel massively strongly about it, they felt quite inspired by the referendum and became much more kind of proactive, I suppose. And so the SNP saw a really big growth in membership. On, again, and they had another charismatic leader in Nicola Sturgeon. 
Um, the party as well moved very much onto Labour territory. The Labour Party used to dominate Scotland. Um, most of the 55 MPs from Scotland up until 2015 were actually Labour MPs. Um, however, Labour lost every single seat in Scotland apart from one in the 2015 election and the Scottish National Party gained them all. Um, so the party is a party of the left in terms of its policies and they effect very effectively argued that Labour was Tory light as an English party and it's because Labour had supported um, union not independence in that referendum. In 2050, as I said here, they wiped out Labour in the House of Commons in Scotland. And Labour's never really recovered in Scotland either. Right, a quick overview of some of their key policies. Uh, they, they're a strong supporters of the EU, and they've said actually that they'd like to go back in the EU if Scotland does become independent. They also want a law passed which will protect the NHS against any kind of uh, trade deals done with the United States or any other countries. They opposed the replacement of Trident. This is Britain's nuclear deterrent on submarines. This they agree with, with uh, uh, Jeremy Corbyn. They want a, a rise of the national minimum wage to £10 an hour. Again, this is, this is exactly also what Corbyn promises. So you can see here how they're on that left of centre territory. They want to cancel the bedroom tax and oppose cuts to child benefit. So again, this is um, opposing some of the Conservatives' welfare reforms. Again, in agreement here with Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party as well. They want a fully elected House of Lords and they want full proportional representation in Westminster, i.e. change the voting system. And they want to protect Scotland's progressive taxation system as well, i.e. the rich pay more tax in Scotland than uh, the poorer end do. So you can see here the quite left and centre and again that might explain why uh, they've taken over quite a lot of those Labour seats. Especially when they said that Labour was an English party that may have tipped over quite a few left and centre people to think well, actually we have to vote for the SNP in Scotland because we get independence and we get these left wing things as well. Right, UKIP. Uh, yeah, I know opponents will say that UKIP and Brexit are two very different parties. I kind of beg to differ. We're going to do them as one anyway. So UKIP can be considered influential for a couple of reasons. Firstly, in the 2015 general election, in terms of the vote, uh, it actually got the third highest number of votes. But it only gained one seat in the House of Commons due to the uh, voting system. In the 2014 European elections, it beat Labour and it beat the Conservatives and the Liberals and gained the most votes in that election. So it clearly had a lot of popular support. And you could argue that their one main policy, which is Brexit, um, had a great influence over David Cameron. He feared that the Conservatives were losing votes to the Brexit, no UKIP, um, he already lost he lost two MPs before the 2015 general election who defected to Brexit. His fear was before the 2015 general election that the Brexit, no, the UK party, sorry, might take away enough Conservative votes and that might then allow the Labour Party to win the election. It might split the Conservative vote, basically. So he made this promise to have a referendum on Europe if he won. So you can see that the influence of UKIP, the fear it was held by people like David Cameron led to them having that referendum and as we know the referendum went the way UKIP wanted and so you could say they've had a really big influence on UK politics despite only having one seat in the House of Commons so uh, they've had a real disproportionate influence UKIP I would say on British politics. A very brief history it was formed in 1993 it did really badly in the 1997 general election because there was another referendum party uh, also around at that time. And it wasn't really until Nigel Farage became their leader that they suddenly began to do quite well. And it gets a little bit like Alex Salmond with the SNP. It's like a charismatic leader of a small party. It can really transform its fortunes if they kind of catch the public mood, etc, uh, etc. Et uh, and I would say that Nigel Farage has done that very effectively. They did really well at the European elections. Uh, they picked up one seat though in the general election. 
Following the resignation of Nigel Farage, the, the party really lost its way, which again would suggest this point I was making before about how charismatic leadership of a small party can often be make or break in many ways. Since his fall, I put he had four leaders in two years, there may even be more than that now, um, they've currently got about 1% in the opinion polls. And then this next slide kind of shows that actually UKIP may have been a bit of a one-man band i.e. this charismatic leader uh, being the be-all and end-all, because Nigel Farage, we know, created the new Brexit party. And again, that was very successful. In 2019, it gained 25 seats, 30% of the vote, because so it got more than any other political party in those European elections. Uh, it got a couple of people elected onto the Welsh Assembly. So again, one man dominating this one man, this one charismatic person um, really seems quite crucial, I would say, to the success of UKIP and then the Brexit party as well. A quick overview of some of their policies. They want Brexit. They want to abolish the business rates. This is a taxation on shops outside the M25, so outside central London. Reduce VAT to zero. Okay. They want to reduce immigration to 50,000 or less. Review the universal credit system. So again, this is that welfare system introduced by David Cameron. They want to review it. Labour wants to get rid of it. They want to review it. So again, they're questioning that universal credit. Again, this might show that they're trying to get those uh, former Labour voters to vote Brexit um, in 2019. They want to remove the 50% target for young people to go to university and they want to change the voting system and the House of Lords. So again, you can see there's some similarities here with other parties, like universal credit. The Conservatives also want to tackle immigration, though they probably want more than 50,000, I would guess. Um, again, low taxation with the business rate, so this that's right idea. So they're not massively ideologically different to the other parties. Uh, just that their big MO, though, was obviously about Brexit. Okay, I will do another video uh, to deal with the Greens and then some of the work on these parties.